Let us pray. Thank you, God, that the spirit of Advent, the spirit of hope, is all around us. May there be more of you and less of me in the things that I say. And may we truly rejoice that you have come and indeed you are coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, for those who've been a part of our worshipping community, either here or online over the last few weeks, you'll know we've been talking about hope and apocalyptic literature now for over a month. And so this first uh, day in Advent, once more, brings those two themes to the fore. Apocalyptic literature, for those who may not be aware of the genre, is, is a bit like Game of Thrones. There's dragons and there's violence and there's things falling from the heavens. It's alarming literary genre that seeks to describe things that are right before us in a way that is surprising. And, and so it helps us to see or take another look to see these things differently. One of the, the skills we need in reading scripture, and it's a skill that grows over a lifetime of familiarizing ourselves with these ancient texts, is to read these texts with what Paul Ricoeur, a, a, a French theologian and, uh, and literary theorist, calls a second naivete. Looking at these ancient texts that, especially when it comes to Christmas time, we've read many times before, but reading it, them as though it's the first time. A little bit like for those who've been married for 50 years and turning over and looking at their partner as if for the first time and seeing that love once more. When we come to these ancient texts, one of the things that we can often do and help to understand them fresh and new is try and relate them to our everyday living. Christians believe that the, the Bible is the living word for us. And if it doesn't come alive in the things that we say and do and the way we interact and engage with the world, it might as well just be a, a wonderful book that sits on the shelf. We believe it is much more than that, that it intersects with our daily lives and, and so how we do that is taking, using the Bible almost like a set of glasses, we put that set of glasses on and it helps us to view the world in which we live and especially apocalyptic literature because it's so fanciful, it has these amazing descriptions, we can translate that, we can put that into our context in a way that helps us to see things differently. And I want to suggest there's three things I want to draw out from these two passages, and I want to suggest it's, we'll find it within all apocalyptic literature. Three things that will help us, if we read these texts carefully, will help us to read our own context. The first is this. I want to suggest that apocalyptic literature is often ugly. We don't often use that word when it comes to the Bible, but there are passages in apocalyptic literature that are really ugly, that describe things that are unpleasant, describe things that are um, that are very confronting. Often the language that is used can be seen as disparaging towards other people, can be considered quite unkind and damaging towards other people. And some, of, some apocalyptic texts have been used to justify violence in horrible ways. There is an ugliness around some apocalyptic literature we need to take seriously. Some apocalyptic literature is also very scary. You know, we read the book of Revelation, some people won't even open that in the nighttime hours because it's so scary. Half the world blows up and you turn the page and the other half blows up and you turn a page and the other half. It seems it's one disaster after the next. It's very scary. And the third thing is, it's ugly, it's scary. The third thing is, sometimes this new and surprising hope comes from where you least expect it. Out of the mouth of a dragon or, or something like that, something amazing emerges. So these three things, the ugly, the scary, and the new, is what I want to talk about. And I want to share it from my past week, because I've just come back from holidays. And I was on holidays at Magnetic Island, which up in North Queensland, which is where I became a Christian when I was 15. So when I returned to Magnetic Island, it's like a, a spiritual pilgrimage for me. And I was able to take back... Uh, with me on this journey, Janet, my wife, and uh, my mother turned 80 a couple of weeks ago, so we had this like week-long birthday celebration, and it was wonderful having family there. But the ugly, the scary, and the new, well, here's the thing. 
over a magnetic island, they have these things called toad races. I don't know about you, but surely one of the ugliest creatures that God ever created was the cane toad, right? Well, at Arcadia Hotel, they have toad races every Wednesday night. And the idea of the toad race is it raises money for the local surf life-saving club. They're called a surf life-saving club, but there's no surf up there. But they do have lifesavers because there's stingers and crocodiles and sharks and everything in the water. So it's good to have some lifesavers there. And to raise money for them, they have toad races. Now, the idea here is each toad has a different colour. And uh, there's, there's no, like, toad studs out there that, you know, they're breeding special toads. They go out during the week and they capture these toads. And they put a special ribbon on them, a different colour, and people bid for their, for their toad. And uh, the night we were there, there were bids up to $240 for a cane toad. All the proceeds go to the Life Saving Club. And uh, it was schoolies week. So we had these young schoolies there bidding $200 on a cane toad. The locals were very impressed. They, they all get put into a bucket. The bucket is lifted, and then the toads are off. And there's like two circles. There's the inner circle, where the, the toads are first started. Then there's the outer circle. And basically, whoever, whichever toad reaches the outer circle wins. And the prize money might be $250, and the bid might have been $240. So for $10, um, you get an opportunity to donate to, to, lurf, to the surf club. Something so ugly, a cane toad. And yet I've never seen so many people cheering for cane toads in my life, because out of this ugliness, there was a sense of hope. If you've ever wondered what would ever bring you to spend $240 on a cane toad, if you're thinking that's beyond your comprehension, you haven't been there at the toad races. Apocalyptic literature opens up this amazing wonder that you could find yourself doing and saying things you could never believe possible. It doesn't make any sense in any other time. But when you're looking for hope, sometimes it's in the ugly places. The scary. We went snorkeling and, and fishing around Magnetic Island. There's this beautiful bay, Florence Bay, which is um, shut off from, it's a, a green zone. You're not allowed to fish there. But you can snorkel there and you can feed the fish. And of course, it turns out fish are quite intelligent. So the fish gather around this place because they know they're not going to get fished, but they know they will get fish. And so we're, we went snorkeling there and then we started feeding the fish. And traditionally, you would feed the batfish, which are these beautiful lovely looking fish with very small mounds. But in the middle of all this, along came a reef cod that would have been about four foot long. And you see his mouth right there. I can assure you, because I was snorkeling with him, he was about as long as my leg, and his teeth are very big. And suddenly, snorkeling and feeding the batfish became scary. But it was also really exciting. So he was hiding under the boat. And you're hanging out the pilchard over the edge, waiting for this big, ugly cod to bring its head up. And its cod would have to be one of the slowest fish in the ocean until it sees its food. And so you're holding this. I've got some footage filmed, but this is just a photo because the footage isn't pretty. And I, I look like a, a teenager jumping out of the way as this fish comes up, so I'm not going to embarrass myself. But this fish hiding under the boat, it's scary, but I found myself hoping that it was going to appear. And I can't help but think, as we read this passage, when Jesus says to stay awake, the anticipation is a little bit scary, but it also enlivens that hope that something out of the ordinary is going to happen. We were excited that the batfish might turn up until we saw the cod. And as scary as that was, it enlivened that moment for us. And the third thing I want to draw attention to is what's called the Aussie Kapok. It's a tree on Magnetic Island, you'll find them from about Townsville North, that uh, it's a green leaf tree that has lovely yellow flowers and different things until the fruit producing time comes. And then all the other leaves fall off and the tree looks completely dead except for these green pods that look a little bit like a ripe green capsicum. And you be going through the bush and you see this tree that looks totally dead until you look up and you see these green pods hanging off it. And you 
when I read up about this, it's, this is what happens every season. That the, the tree puts all of its life, all of its energy, all of its sustenance into these green pods. It doesn't need the leaves anymore. It looks barren, but it's actually producing this pod that will produce the seed that will reproduce itself. All of its hope goes into this one thing. The rest of the tree looks dead, but here there is life. The Advent story, the story of Jesus, we find these three things. We romanticize the, the manger, the stable. I want to suggest to you that's a really ugly place to give birth to a baby. We romanticize the, the Christmas story. But I want to suggest to you for an unwed teenage mother in the first century, that was a very scary time for Mary. But out of that ugliness, out of that scary time, in the midst of the barrenness, this beautiful new hope came into the world. In our year this year, I want to suggest to you, and we can joke about it, but there's something really ugly about going to a shopping centre when the shelves are bare for essential items because we've acted out of our own fear. There's something really ugly about that. There's something very scary about seeing hospitals overflowing in places that we wish we could go for, to for a holiday and realising that makeshift morgues and makeshift hospitals have, have to be enacted because of this pandemic. But there's also something incredibly hopeful that in the middle of this, this traumatic time, we've discovered new ways to connect with one another online or in other forms of church. We've had people contact us from Western Australia, Victoria, North Queensland. Even today, as we've gathered back here in this space, there are people watching online who are unable to come to church in, in other countries. New things that have emerged out of something that has been stripped bare. We heard a great theological statement earlier in the service that God is in the last remaining French fry. I want to suggest God is in the last remaining French fry as you share it with someone who's hungry. God is in that last remaining roll of toilet paper when you share it with someone who doesn't have any. God is in the ugly places, in the scary places, in the barren places, if we look really closely. And may this season of Advent open our eyes once more to see God even here, even in our community. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for Advent hope. Not some sort of optimism that is frivolous and trivial, but that deep-seated hope that will not let go of your promise that you are bringing reconciliation and transformation to the world. That sort of hope that is seen in ugly places and scary places and barren places. The sort of hope that becomes part of our DNA. That as a church, we would be a people of hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.